This is Dr. Chris's Radio Horror Program on 91.3 FM WCUW in Worcester, Massachusetts with a recorded interview with one of uh, Animator's greatest directors, Ralph Bakshi. Thank you for coming on the show with us, Ralph. That's fine. I'm glad to be here. Ralph, you have worked on some amazing bodies of work your entire career. And I know that you have a new project coming out. Before we get into your classic work, um, tell us a little bit about what The Last Days of Coney Island is about, because I'm not very familiar with that. Okay, well, sure, I'd be glad to. Um, <laughs> you know, one of, the, one, of, one of the ways I work is I'm not quite sure. I'll tell you what it's about, but one of the ways I, that I work is, you know, it's sort of like a construction um, and things evolve as I go. In other words, I don't. I have a bunch of characters I get together, and they start playing out lives, their lives, and they all have different personalities. And you know, in the beginning, I'm telling them what to do and what to say, and then uh, if, if everything is working right, like a heavy traffic, let's say, or coonskin, they start telling me what they have to say, and things sort of grow in different directions that are unexpected. And I think a lot of the stuff that's unexpected becomes deep down stuff that's been sitting inside me for a long time that somehow I get to the surface. It's very much like working as an abstract painter. You know, when you build the painting as you go, you're not quite sure what the end result will be. But you start with certain parameters. Many times the film doesn't seem to want to work and you get very depressed and you think you lost it, you don't have it, you have nothing to say. And stuff keep pushing things around. Stuff starts to rise to the surface. That's the difference, mainly in the way I work, as opposed to, let's say, most animation studios that set out storyboards and lock everything down. And then when stuff is locked down, uh, which is okay, except for minor changes, you know, it pretty much stays as to what was locked down on storyboards and character design. I keep things open. You know, I started this last day that called me on with one lead character and then became the unlead character and another character that surprised me took over. Um, it's hard to explain exactly how I work to myself or anyone else, but I've always had that, um, which is why it's hard for me to collaborate. It's hard for me to pin stuff down in the beginning and, and say, this is it. But most of the early stuff you write is total lies trying to be cute, or you're trying to be smart, trying too hard to be smart, and all of that eventually starts eating away at the honesty, what am I really trying to say in this movie, um, so that's how it works, I, I'm telling you something, it took me years to find out, I wasn't quite sure, when I was younger, what the hell I was doing, you know, sometimes I even thought I was crazy, but now that I'm an older man, I'm <laughs> but anyhow, uh, so the personal way of hope that you have a commercial hit, I never a commercial hit, but it's a, it's a personal way of making film, which is in animation, an amazingly easy thing to do, giving, in other words, animation has the, um, has the ability to change, to throw out, you know, not take itself so seriously. Well, that's, that's basically, so what's Coney Island about? It's about the 60s in Coney Island. It's basically the, about what came down and where we ended up heading for the, you know, the, you know, San Francisco and the great, the hippie revolution. So it kind of, but it starts with what, what was wrong with us. And in some ways, it starts with Coney Island, which is once the mecca of entertainment in America and Brooklyn and how it's, over the years, changed. And one of the key lines is they're killing all the clowns and this little dwarf shorty, you know, who's running around. He, he's in charge of the freaks, getting kickbacks from the freaks. But he's a freak, but they mock the eye of him. He's very short, very egotistical, you know. But um, about his life, his love, it's about cops, their lives and love. It's about uh, cops that go wrong. It's about all the assassinations. In other words, there are a lot of people killed during that period, um, which seemed to me to be one long string of people who were leftist or people who wanted to change the country for the better were assassinated. You know, of course, there was the Kennedy, and then there was the Kennedy's brother. No one talks about that. They keep talking about John. Martha 
and you know, there's a lot of stuff that can't, and can't stay. So there's a lot of stuff that we go through, but the animated characters are watching stuff on television, and one of the women say in a bar, when, when they're having the Kennedy funeral on television, she says, oh, it, it's a, a good little Johnny, he's so cute for losing his dad, he's so cute. But we get back to the banality of some of our lives and how we, you know, uh, it's not a lot of things. It's, uh, it's also very funny, I think, in spots, so. And those, and that, I'm trying to a lot of things. So it's a murder, it's a murder cop story wrapped around the events uh, of what was happening in mm-hmm. my life and how I felt about it now. So um, I have my characters articulate some of those feelings. Like, oh, I'm sitting in a bar in, in Brooklyn, and this woman did say, look how cute, look how cute Kennedy is. Johnny <laughs> is just losing his father. Oh, isn't he cute? My mouth fell open. Wow, it's it's kind of interesting that this is coming out when we're right on top of the 50th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Well, yeah, well, you know, basically it was interesting because part of this last days that coming out about five years ago. Um, uh, it's always been about that in a sense, um, uh, but that's always been an important thing to me. You know, uh, you know, I grew up with that, of course, and I saw I saw the initial killing of Oswald on television. You know, and uh, uh, <laughs> one character is getting interrogated in my movie, Shorty. He's getting interrogated by cops to beating the shit out of him in the room. And they think he murdered somebody. And they ask him, well, if you one more time, you little creep, did you kill blah, blah, blah? He says, no, Lee Harvey Oswald did it. And so they, they get a laugh out of it because people know how stupid that is. I think that Lee Harvey Oswald killed anybody. <laughs> you know, um, from 10,000 miles away with one shot. You know, anyhow, I couldn't hit a stickball that good. So. Anyhow, so it's about those things. I'm being vague in some areas. I want to tell you the whole story, of course. But it's difficult. You know, it's what I do. It's, it's what I love to do. The um two the the two projects I'm the biggest fan that you've worked on was the Adventures of Mighty Mouse in the 1980s and the Spider-Man cartoon series from the 1960s. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about t- tell us a little bit about the uh, your work on uh, Mighty Mouse and Spider-Man. Well, Spider-Man. I thought with Spider-Man was before Mighty Mouse. Well, I was Spider-Man was in the late 60s, early 70s. To me, in, the, in as much as it was a big deal. In other words, uh, I loved Spider Man as a character. I grew up with Spider Man. Of course, I was part of the Marvel hero. I knew all the guys that drew it. They were all my friends. The Ditko's and, and Joe Cupid and all the guys that drew Spider Man. It was a chance to bring a comic book character to television, which was in those days a little more real. A little or a lot, I don't remember that much anymore, more realistic than what was going on because Spider-Man had a personality and he was worried that the kid would hang up, you know, when he didn't have his costume on. So, in a sense, that little bit of realism was something I really attached myself to. But working for television at those low budgets wasn't exactly easy. And it's not a pleasant memory trying to make deadlines. So, um... It was very, very hard. Um, I don't know what to say about it other than I enjoyed working on it to a point. But like all animation, it has to be done on budget for television in those days. You, it is a, it's an animation revolution now. Um, things are very good in animation. In those days, people hated animation, so they didn't pay much to get things done. So it was very hard to do things in those days. Getting any kind of quality into them. Do you watch? Anything, you know, so. Do you watch a lot of the current animation that's out there? No. No. The no. um. um no, I don't. Uh, I, I, I had glimpses of it on Netflix. I suddenly check certain things out. I'm kind of stunned at the sort of um, tremendous uh, ability to turn amazing scenes on the screen through the computer. My mouth drops open as to some of the startling stuff that these young guys do. Um, uh, I'm kind of you know, extraordinary. But, um, you know, I'm not about animation, you know, and, that's, and I respect that 
that, and that's unbelievable. And the dollars they're making are fantastic, but I don't watch it because the end result is it. it I don't really enjoy it. Well, I could watch it to the degree where, you know, I'm, I'm not an animator. I'm not an animation fan per se. I'm not about the art of moving something. You know, most animation studios or all animation studios, the guys and wives had the most trouble in the animation business over the years. Um, well, the guys are about moving stuff. They don't care what they move, and they move it very well now, and they move it brilliantly. And, um, I do it. And I'm not about that. You know, my animation is serviceable, or my animation is funky, but it, to me, it's not animation and the motion of the characters isn't what it's about at all. And I think that's the big mistake. You can't say that I'm an animator and if I move something right, the ball game's over. So that's, that's really another thing that there's an animator I saw on giving a big lecture, I'm not going to mention his name the other day, and he was all about performance and animation and if you put your foot here, and the foot here, and the foot here, and then you bend it here, and you bend it here, and you bend it here, and you walk. That's how you produce the walk. And, you know, that's great, but who cares? <laughs> I mean, an animated guy can go walk across the screen. I don't care how you get there. Where is he walking, and why is he walking? And, you know, it's more important to me. So, it's hard for you to watch these films. Uh, um, um, I like good movies. You know, I like Fred Bacon's my favorite painter. I mean, I like emotional things. Um, um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, like, I never watched much animation. I think that's what saved me as a kid. I never went to Disney movies. We didn't have any television at home. We were so poor. And if we did, I don't know if they were Bucks Bunny in the 50s and 60s. So I wasn't trapped with watching all this stuff that most of the guys watch now and trying to emulate. I don't have any real animation heroes. That's live action heroes. That photographers. You know, I love painters. Uh, I love the beat writers. Um, what I'm saying is, my whole background was had nothing to do with how cute animation was. I never, I never aspired to redo Fantasia or redo Snow White. You know, most of the animators in my age who get on stage or something. They, they were impressed by Fantasia, they were impressed by Snow White, but they thought they were crazy. And, you know, I, that wasn't my background, you know. I looked at Batman Chapters. When I went to the movies, I loved the Batman Chapters and live actors, you know, Flash Gordon, that kind of, you know, the Marx Brothers. I, you know, that's what inspired me. Um, so I was lucky enough to avoid most of the animation cliches as a kid, so it didn't ingrain myself. It didn't get in my brain to say this is the way to do it. Yeah. So, so no, I don't watch much, but I'm very impressed by what I see visually. It's stunning. Absolutely stunning. I, I just got done watching, uh, rewatching Wizards uh, with your commentary on, and and it seems like Wizards seems to be your favorite of uh, all of, out of your entire body of work. Wizards seems to be your favorite project. Well, I love Wizards very much. It was uh, what would it have to say in the day about pollution, you know, terrorism. Um, you know, I think it takes a start if I remember right with terrorists blowing up the world. But, you know, it has its place about digging up archival stuff, you know, and misplacing what it was originally. Of course, there's always that anti-Nazi stand, which is very important to me, you know. Um, uh, the fascism can come back any time you turn your back on it. And of course it has. And um, so what I'm saying is that was a very important motif to me. And uh, uh, the witness was important to me. It had to do with the struggle uh, of Israel. It had to be, you know, like a struggle of Jews over the years. So um, it was, there was a lot of stuff going on with it uh, that was secret. <laughs> yeah, I like the picture very much. The um when I when I watched it I was completely blown away with the um the fact you know it was like set in the future and you have the uh the evil black wolf using the um the images of Nazi Germany to to rally his troops and scare his brother's enemy. Well, yeah, uh, Nazi propaganda and all propaganda is enormously powerful and still around. It's propaganda. Uh, that the Nazis did so brilliantly in propaganda that a lot of guys are doing brilliantly today. You, know, you don't know which end is up today. Um, you know, I, there's no reason why Iran to be producing uranium. But yeah, we all know what they're after in the end. But no one seems to care. What I'm saying is that everything's got to spin, you know? And if you spin it 
America and the world go to sleep or they they can sleep well. You know what I'm saying? Um, now, uh, so yeah, I have a lot to say. You know, I'm basically saying that uh, things don't go away until you take care of them. You know, they propaganda and old films. Nazism could rise in a second um, if things go wrong. And I read in the New York Times, as we all know, in different papers, that the rise of the right wing in Europe, because things are so bad there, economically, is, is enormously troublesome to everyone. Hello? You know. The, um... you know that's the kind of films I make, you know. I'm not preaching, by the way. I can't explain it. These are the thoughts that go through my mind when I make a film. I'm not saying you just do that kind of thing to do a great animated film or a good animated film. I'm just letting you know how I work. That I need ideas to spin off of so my characters can have some meaning to me other than how they move. In other words, we're back to motion in which most animators think their job is done when they move to stuff brilliantly. And a lot of them have unbelievable motion. But if there's nothing really pushing that person other than the gag, what's the purpose? I mean, I don't, I don't see uh, the purpose of that. I need ideas or think ideas with my thoughts. That's the way I work. It, it allows me to write my, my, my dialogue on. Otherwise, my characters don't say anything. <laughs> I'm a very funny guy, and I get like, I don't know how to do gags. I don't particularly care for the Marx Brothers, by the way. One I film... I'm not, I'm not too familiar with the Marx... I mean, I know who the Marx Brothers are, but I've never really, I've never really got into their <laughs> stuff. Kid. Kid. It, it's a little bit older for me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but, you know... The, I love it. There's uh, one film in particular I'm yours... Sorry. I, the, I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I the, get 75 this year. I became 75. Uh, uh, well, you, you you sound fantastic, sir. Um, what? I said you sound fantastic, sir. Well, thank you. I'm trying to finish this movie. I'm animating this movie, you know. There's one film. I'm fil- animating the movie myself. What? There's one film in particular I haven't had a chance to check out. It's called Fire and Ice. Um, for anyone listening who's not familiar with it, uh, what is Fire and Ice about? Fire and Ice. Oh, there's nothing about that picture. I wanted to work with my friend Frank Zetta. Frank Zetta is a great fantasy painter. I don't know if you know him. You should look him up. But there was a great artist called Frank Zetta. He did all these fantasy covers, calling in the Barbarian and everything. And he was a good guy, good friend of mine, one of the best painters of fantasy art in the world. Everyone loves him. And it was an opportunity to work with him. You know what I mean? So I wanted to work with him. I was finished. In other words, I was all burnt down. I had a lot of fights. It was very difficult. I was leaving the business. In other words, it wasn't anything I cared about. It. I had had it. In other words, there were too many fights, too many pictures of mine cut up. I mean, if you think, if you think it was, it wasn't fun. It was very difficult for me and my family to get the pictures out financially for my studio and. To fight all those fights to try to keep the studio from cutting my pictures up or calling me racist and God knows what else. So I was pretty tired and burnt out. You know, I was drinking a lot. So Fire and Ice was nothing more to me than to sit back and not care. It was about a bunch of guys running around with loincloth throwing stairs at each other. You know, try to face a princess from getting hurt. You know, you're um. Your son was telling us. I'm sorry. Sorry, your um, your son was telling us that you're also a pretty big um, New York Giants fan. Yeah, I like this group. I like the Giants. Yeah. We would be mortal enemies. I'm a big Washington Redskin fan. <laughs> you guys lost today. I uh, yeah, I know. Don't remind me. <laughs> Look at that quarterback for Philly. Isn't he something? Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's not the. Uh, it's not the. Uh, about the Giants, I'm a 
lying to me or, or, or no, I'm not, no, no, it's okay, you know. Yeah, we fight all the time. It's Dallas who I dislike them. It's Dallas that the, you know that gets me crazy. Did you um, did you uh, looking at your body of work? How come you never made like a like an animated like sports film or something? Being a bit kind of a sports fan. Jackie Robinson story. Oh, really? Yes, I wanted to do the Jack. I saw Jackie play in Epic Field, and he was a hero of mine when I was a young kid. Uh, as he was to a lot of young kids in Brooklyn. Um, my parents were immigrants, and of course they ran away from the Germans, which is how we got to America. Um, so he was an underdog playing brilliantly. Um, so I would love to have done the Jackie Robinson. That was a sports story. I wanted to do the Sonny Liston story, but I couldn't get the right. Um, it was another one. But I was interested in doing a sports story, yeah. The uh, Did you see uh, 42? Excuse me? Did you see the movie 42? No, I did not. Nope, I wasn't going to see it. I don't like to see movies or pictures I wanted to make that someone else make. That's why I haven't looked at Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I just change. You know, I don't want to see someone that does a better job than I would have done. Yeah, I, 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 I had heard that your uh, your son had actually mentioned that to me that uh, he's like because I asked him I was like so did your father see the Lord of the Rings and he's like no dad did not go see the uh, Peter Jackson films. <laughs> no, I would go see something. You know, I will. I'll funny that way, you know. I don't, I don't know. The um, I don't watch that much movies. I'm not a movie buff. That's the whole thing, you know. All these guys grew up wanting to be film directors. I just wanted to be a cartoonist. You know, political cartoonist. Bill Malden was a favorite. I wanted to do, uh, I think Bill Malden was great, William and Joe. But that's again, all before your time. <laughs> do you, uh, yeah, I'm okay. have you, uh, you, have you ever thought about writing, a, like, a, an autobiography about your entire animation career? I keep thinking I'd start one, but then I'm too busy. I don't know. I think I should. Yeah, I mean, God, you've worked with some of the some some great um, talent and some great animators, and on some such you know great projects. Again, like uh, 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 one what the the cartoon series that got me hooked on Mighty Mouse was your cartoon series from the eighties, The Adventures of Mighty Mouse, um, yeah. and I fell in love with the character, and 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 I was, but that was the first time I'd ever seen it was on your How series. Old are you? How old are you? I am thirty three. No, that's good. Okay. <laughs> but the new adventures of Mighty Mouse loved it. That's what got me hooked on that character, and I loved the. And I found out years later when I learned about who you were that you, you were the uh, supervising director on it. You would sell for Mighty Mouse. I will tell that. You want to put up on your wall somewhere? Yeah, that would be that would be fantastic. Possibly your most controversial piece of work is Fritz the Cat, don't you think? I mean, is that does that no, still come back to you as being really controversial? Um, I mean, what was the, what, when, when you were making it, what was like the general reaction from, from, from people that you, that, that knew you and, uh, what were the questions they were asking you about, uh, about this adult cartoon? Turned on me. I mean, um, big time. I was up 
pornographer. All the animated, most of the animated, uh, just like, uh, hated what I was doing. Was vehement about it. Um, when I went to L.A., which I had never worked at, we got thrown out of New York. I started first to Cat in New York City in the 5th building on 57th Street. But the union um, got on my case. We had to leave New York. Um, believe it or not, no one knows that. I don't know, maybe they do. But I had to go to California. I had to stop a fixture. We had done half the fixture in New York by the time I was forced to leave. Now, that's hard. Don't forget, I'm a New York boy. We started animating in New York. All my animated friends, all my animators who were working for me were guys I grew up in Terry Tunes with, I knew who I was dealing with. And now I had to go to California, which was a I had never been to before. And so hiring animators I knew nothing about, right? Um, so it was a little very tough time. Plus, I was worried about the film. How do you pick up a home movie and transport it? You know, there are physical problems to that. So I get to LA and open up an office. And that was the priority, priority, the newspaper there, Bar, Bar City, right? You, the newspaper in New York or Boston? The newspaper in L.A. Oh, um, the L.A. Times? Right, but yeah, it was a, it was a well, it was a, or a house or you not to get, uh, variety, variety. Can we hear variety? Yes, yes. It's still published, yeah, I think. Right. What? I think it's still published, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Yep. So it was a major, in those days, before the next, before the it was a major. It was a major. Everyone read Baron every day. And there was a huge ad in the center, double page, in the center of variety, uh, that said that guys like me, oh, it said something like, um, we who have worked so hard and attained the Disney image are appalled by Ralph Bakshi bringing his pornography to L.A., right? We could test it, and um, it was fine by the top animators in Los Angeles that I should go home. So, that's, you talk about being on a hot seat, so it's very depressing, because I was an animator. And I don't understand why anyone did see how funny this picture was. <laughs> wow. You know, or why everyone still wants me to be Walt Disney. You know, or I could do whatever the hell I wanted. You know, whether they liked it or not, would have, you know. But this is the kind of reactions that I would get. Now, there was a bunch of guys that came to my rescue, or the bench. The guys that animated my film were the old Warner Brothers guys. There was a Virgil Roth, Manny Perez, the guys that did Daffy Duck and Warner Brothers were all out of work. I don't think he was dying when I came into, uh, you know, when I, when I went to L.A., animation was dying. Um, television was taking long. All the short studios had shut down. Paramount had shut down. Warner Brothers, MGM. You know, that's a lot of guys out of work. Yeah. Um, they, they, they understood. Some of them understood. They understood what I was doing because they were all pros. And they were doing at least the Warner Brothers stuff, which is Daffy Duck and Bug. So they understood a, a lot about craziness. And they backed me 100%, about four or five of them now. You know, so they were very, very great at it. Earth says all the credits are on my film, on all my films. And they helped me. You know, they, I was a kid from New York. I was working in L.A. under tough conditions. No one wanted to work with me. But once they came aboard, the things got a little better as far as being able to hire guys, because these guys were very much uh, revered and loved in L.A. because of their bunch of funny work and everything. So that eased it up. And basically, um, to this day, to this very day, a lot of the animators think I ruined the business. You know? That's, uh, don't listen to them. <laughs> Yeah, and it, like you look at it didn't stop. It didn't stop. That was just the beginning. And honestly, I mean, and honestly, uh, Ralph, I mean, com 
Fritz the Fritz the Cat compared to let's say like what's on television these days like Family Guy, The Simpsons, South Park, American Dad. The animation is so unbelievably adult and raunchy at times that Fritz the Cat is really tame. <laughs> I know. I mean, I know. this is on television every day. It's on Fox every day at like six o'clock in the afternoon usually. I mean, the normal new episodes are on at like. 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night, but they still then do reruns around the time that children are usually still up. It's 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 unbelievable how, you know, like, you were ridiculed then, but today it's being praised as some of the best animation ever. <laughs> I understand that. I understand that. And that's, you know, those are blows you take. I know that Joe DiMaggio and Joe Pesci are going to be making $100,000 a year. You know, you got a kid who can't hit it goes 150 No. Okay. If you see any traffic, look at the, the, the character in there, the, the father of Michael. We gotta see it. You look, go look at it. Anyhow, what else? Uh, what can I tell you? you you're right. Unfortunately, I, I, I probably have like a thousand more questions, and we might have to do like a second interview later on in the future, probably well, after Coney right. Island comes out. But yeah. we're uh, we uh, we really do appreciate you taking the time out to come on the show and, and oh, talk wow. about your long, long oh, career. Wow. And again, you should write or have maybe your son or somebody write it for you a biography about your career because that would make a, a, a fantastic read and go through you know even going into things like Lord of the Rings and and Cool World that are you know weren't always, um, you know, under your control at times. Um, but just, you know, people want to hear those stories. It would it would make for a fantastic novel. Well, I'm ready. Maybe I'll take your advice. Uh, it was one long sight. I feel much better about it. I love doing Last Days of Coney Island. I'm mean, athletic, though. It may be the best thing. I've, I'm... Right now, I love it just as much or more than anything I've done. So, um... I'm very excited about it. I'm animating the whole thing. I haven't done that since I was a young kid. And Terry too. So you got a lot of stake in it. And it's coming along good. Again, it started off rough. They said earlier, but it's short. And now it's pulling itself together. I'm very happy with it. Cool. So, um, that's what I'm saying. I appreciate anyone who's interested in that. So uh, maybe I will write it. Cool. Awesome. Doctor. Maybe I will write it, Mr. Doctor. <laughs> uh,